This is the Great Barrier Reef. Wonderful, beautiful and alive. But soon it may well be one of the few remaining live reefs around the world. Because around the world the coral reefs are dying. Scientists predict that within 20 years, one third of the world's coral reefs will be dead. And in 40 years, two thirds dead. Some of the reefs are dead already. And the causes are many, but mostly it's man's interference with nature. Now I've been diving for over 40 years on these coral reefs, and it truly saddens me to see these precious coral reefs slowly dying. Places like Southeast Asia and the Caribbean are the biggest problem. Philippine reefs are in really bad state. The Japanese reefs, particularly those around Okinawa, are, are gone. Many of the reefs in the Caribbean, Jamaica, Haiti, Dominican Republic, they're in really bad state. I'd add to that Florida, Sri Lanka, India, the east coast of Africa, those reefs are in bad state. Basically because people are overusing reefs and exploiting them too heavily. There's too much stress on coral reefs by human populations. It's a pity. Actually, a few years ago, the coral around here are uh, very, very good. But when we have development, particularly tourist development, and that caused a lot of deterioration to the reef. Greece used to be a vast coral gardens from one end to the other. Beautiful, beautiful Elkhorn coral, particularly on the south, southern end of Grecian rocks. Now there today, the Elkhorn coral is still there, but it's skeletons, it's all dead and taken over by algae. About 20 feet from the beach was a lot of life. You had sea fans, coral, sea urchins, white sea urchins, the black sea urchins, and all that's disappeared now. It does make you want to cry. I mean, you feel, you're hurt inside, that's all. The island of Okinawa is my first stop on a world tour to assess the global state of coral reefs. Tourist development here is massive. It is the worst example of overdevelopment I have seen, with dire consequences for the environment. I join a group of Japanese marine experts who are assessing Okinawa's coral reefs. Uh, more than 90% of, of Okinawan sun uh, corals are dead. Well, huh? well, already about 10% of the world's coral reefs are dead, and Okinawa is probably one of the worst in the world. Like Okinawa, uh, how much, what percentage do you think? 98%. Are you sure, huh? Yes, sir. Well, see, 18 years ago, I came to Okinawa and dived, but, but when I came in 18 years ago, I remarked to my diving friends, I said, you have a beautiful coral reef. It looked good. Oh. And now when I came back, I couldn't believe it was just dead, dead. Those uh, magazine pictures were taken perhaps... Maybe 15 years ago, oh. because all this happened <clears throat> about between 10 and 15 years ago. Mac Okada is my guide. He's been a diving buddy of mine for 20 years. Wherever I swim on Okinawa's fringing coral reefs, I see only death. A few live specimens are temporary regrowth, and they will soon die. All coral are dead here. And 15 years ago, it was here very, very beautiful here. I don't know why, but uh, well, I guess uh, bad pollution or something. When Japan reclaimed Okinawa from the US in 1972, they set about bringing it up to the standard of mainland Japan. Six billion dollars a year went into massive, ill-conceived development. The coral reefs were forgotten. Ugly cement tetrapods wall in more than half the island. Beyond these sea walls, awash with sewerage and toxic discharge, the coral reef is but a skeleton covered in algae. There are no fish. 
The hills are scarred by quarries feeding hungry cement plants, churning out millions of grotesque blocks. Government billions had to be spent. When they completed the sea walls, they moved out into the lagoon and built breakwaters. Why? I really don't know. This boat harbour is almost empty. Still more and more are being built. Okinawa's rivers are sorely degraded. Most have been transformed into cement drains, rivers without life. Clearing for agriculture causes the land to erode. The soil, along with the fertilizers and pesticides, is swept into the cement-lined rivers and flushed out to the coral lagoon. This sediment smothers and kills the corals, for they thrive in clean, nutrient-starved waters. Fertilizing golf courses feeds more nutrients to the corals. <laughs> Japanese love of seafood empties Okinawa's seas. At the fish market, it was evident that they catch and eat everything and anything the sea has to offer. Traditional fishing methods are still employed around Okinawa. Goggle divers are herding the fish into a net. But these fish are herbivorous bottom feeders and they should be left to eat the algae which is smothering the corals. Yoshimin is a local diver who took the graphic pictures of the live to dead corals. Yoshimin is still documenting the dying corals, going back to the exact location he photographed live about 15 years ago. He has taken his evidence to the government, who has replied, there's no problem, the corals are okay. Yoshimin sees it differently. The corals are indeed dead. At Cape Maeda, there is a tiny pocket of surviving corals. This is because a clean ocean current bathes the corals only at this point. I counted almost a hundred scuba divers swarming over this last remaining garden, loving it to death. Only 50 meters away, it is completely dead. Cyclone number 15 whips up big swells as it passes Okinawa. I'm on the first ferry running to Tokashiki Island in the nearby Kerama group. All these people have been stranded here by the cyclone. Very beautiful coral reef here. Yeah? Yeah. Comparing the main island, island of Okinawa, it's very beautiful, no pollution. Mako Kada brought Lynn and I here because the corals are wonderfully alive. The locals have so far rejected government offers for massive development. Just come back. Oh, beautiful. Kerama is still very good. I mean, it's still got a beautiful coral reef, much like what Okinawa had uh, back 18 years ago. And I think it's very important for the Japanese government to protect Kerama now. I don't really think Okinawa will ever have another live coral reef again because the cause is so great. But Kerama, yes, Kerama can be saved providing you don't repeat what has happened in Okinawa. Thailand has fringing coral reefs. But it's also an industrial giant and mega tourist destination with big
problems. In Thailand, their major tourist area was Pattaya Bay near Bangkok. No tourists would go there now to look at coral reefs. They've gone to Phuket on the western side of Thailand. Those reefs are now being damaged. And so everywhere they go with unwise tourist development, the reefs are being damaged. The luxury on Pattaya Beach is deceiving. I can smell the raw sewage out here. No one swims at Pattaya Beach. The sea is too polluted. The biggest hotels were recently forced to install sewage treatment plants. This has slightly improved the water quality, but not enough to go for a swim. Instead, the tourists are taken in a hundred boats to nearby islands, where I saw an incredible tourist assembly line launching paragliders at the rate of one every minute. Speedboats and jet skis zoom everywhere. I saw very few people in the water. It was too dangerous. A hundred anchors take their toll on the coral every day. Len and I chance a look at the corals. The corals are 70% dead, and we find an example of coral bleaching. The commensal zoanthellae, which gives the coral its vibrant colours, has vacated its host and left the coral bleach white, but still alive. The cause is probably pollution. Thailand's Koh Samui is an island crowned with coconuts, complete with monkeys to pick them. Koh Samui's new hotels are built right on the beach. The smell of raw sewage pervades my nostrils wherever I go. The water table is poison. Everyone drinks bottled water. I'm told Koh Samui once had a beautiful coral reef. We joined some tourists at one of their best dive spots. A net shrouds the coral, which is 80% dead. Algae is dominant in a cloudy sea. The algae-eating fish too often end up on a spear. Professor Surafan Sadara is Thailand's foremost authority on coral reefs. He guides me to the worst affected area. I see a graveyard covered in algae with very little coral alive. What do you think the problem is? It's a pity. Actually, a few years ago, the coral around here are very, very good. But when we have development, particularly tourist development, there are lots of hotels being built up. So the first thing is that the sediment can be transported down into the sea directly. And that causes a lot of deterioration to the reef. You've got a lot of sedimentation coming from the prawn farms. They've destroyed all the mangroves in along the coast and they've turned these mangroves into fish farms. And the fish farms have become toxic, but all that uh, high nutrient uh, in the water and all the sedimentation is flowing back out to these islands and over the coral reefs of Koh Samui and smothering and killing the corals. And I suppose the live corals are only about 20%. It's all happened in the last five to 10 years and the water is filthy. You can only see about three meters. Samui International Diving took me away from the polluted waters to remote Sail Rock in the middle of the Gulf. Here I see a splendid array of thriving corals. 
Thailand is in a better state right now, that we are aware of the problems. Even though the underwater tourist business is not that great in this country as yet, but it's starting. When it's starting, people become aware of the problems, and we are trying to cope with the problems. Australia's Great Barrier Reef, a living jewel in a rainbow sea, the largest coral reef in the world. Its saving grace is it lies well offshore, away from coastal pollution. This is my family's idyllic playground. The Great Barrier Reef is a dynamic ecosystem created by colonies of tiny animals called polyps. Mass synchronized spawning begins at night in November, several days after the full moon. The eggs sweep upwards in a technicolor blizzard, freeing both eggs and sperm to fertilize with their counterparts from other corals of the same species. This new generation adds a thin veneer of living beauty to the skeletons of their forebears. Along Queensland's north coast, fringing coral reefs hug the shore. Over the years, I've personally seen these reefs deteriorate, and today they are 80% dead. We have the same problems here as I've seen overseas. But we're particularly concerned about those reefs that are close to the coast and inshore because they're the ones we think are being affected by land runoff from sewerage, agriculture and things like that, urban development as well perhaps. Um, the evidence for this is anecdotal, they're people's recollections of what the reefs were like um, some time ago and uh, the main thing that seems to be happening is that the reef, the coral part of the reef, has been replaced by algae. And this is a sign, I think, that uh, the problem is nutrients coming off the land. A nutrient is a substance which can be used by an organism for its growth. Nutrients can reach the sea by river runoff, and their effect is felt throughout the entire system, right up the food chain. If the nutrient level overloads the system, then what is called eutrophication occurs, which is a nuisance algae growth which competes successfully with the corals for space. Excessive nutrients also kill the corals directly. Sedimentation smothers. Raw sewerage poisons. Tertiary treated sewerage is a must for all coastal communities to lessen the impact of nutrients on the reef. The only scientific evidence, however, that we have at the moment is from this technique of coral coring. Corals grow in a yearly growth and some of the corals off here are two or three hundred years old. So when we take a core out of them we can actually see back into time. And the analysis of that coral record has really shown that things have changed in the last 50 years and changed for the worst. Scientists from the Australian Institute of Marine Science are now monitoring nutrient levels of our coastal coral reefs. Um, the reason why we use this particular machine is that it gives discrete small samples and as you're seeing here at the moment 
uh, we're taking small subcores and we cut chop those up into two centimeter sections. And what that gives us is a profile from the top of the sediment down deeper to about 20 centimeters of the levels of nutrients in the, uh, in the sediment. Now there's many times more nutrients in the sediments than in the water column, and that's why we're spending a lot of time doing this. So what we're doing now is we're taking what's called a Niskin cast. Uh, the purpose of it is, is to take uh, a discrete water sample. Um, usually in that size, it's anywhere from about 10 to 20 mils of water. Uh, and when you see it coming up, back up on the boat, uh, we're taking samples for dissolved nutrients, uh, for, for particulate nutrients, for salinity, temperature. All that will give us some idea of what's uh, going on in the water column, particularly in terms of the health uh, of the given area. Coral reefs have natural predators. The most infamous is the crown of thorn starfish. Plagues of starfish have devastated reefs around the world. They may be a natural cyclical phenomenon or exacerbated by human activities. It has been suggested that it, there is a correlation between the crown of thorns outbreaks on the Great Barrier Reef proper with elevated nutrient levels. Um, one of the possible reasons, causes for that is, is that the elevated nutrient levels uh, tend to stimulate larval production of the crown of thorns starfish and also of other organisms that they feed on. A myriad of fish disturb and chew the corals. The Great Barrier Reef has experienced 145 cyclones this century, each cutting a path of destruction. Normally, damaged reefs recover within a few years, unless man-made stress factors inhibit their growth. Some popular reefs have been decimated by reef walkers. When they fail to turn back coral rocks, all the exposed creatures die. Coral reefs are fragile marvels. Education in care is paramount. I've seen boat anchors change the shape of a reef. One should anchor only on sand. Moorings are a necessity for regular users. Divers usually take the greatest care, but they can still love a reef to death. Giant clams farm the same zooanthellae that lives in the coral polyp and may pass on the excess to the polyps. But Taiwanese clam poachers scour the Pacific coral reefs for the meat of the giant clam. A fatal stab takes only the muscle, a mere 300 gram high-priced delicacy. It is inevitable that a major oil spill will one day devastate our coral reef. 35 oil spills have occurred over the past three years in our reef waters. Europeans, of course, have been here for 150 years. In 40,000 years, there was very little impact from the Aborigines. In 150 years, we've seen tremendous impact brought about by Europeans on the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, in the last, uh, I'd say the last 25 years, has seen the most impact when we've seen exponential numbers of people coming from not only within Australia, but internationally to visit the Great Barrier Reef. Tourist activity has expanded right along the reef. Commercial fishing is now a multi-million dollar industry on the reef. The reef itself is a multi-use area. The Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, of course, has been in existence for 15 years and uh, its uh, evolvement and development has been almost paralleling the massive increase in tourism and other activities that have taken place on the reef. 
We've been hard pressed to keep up with developing uh, strategies and management practices that are going to cope with this great impact. We've been working very hard to develop baseline data on the ecology of the Great Barrier Reef, the effect that human beings are having on it, and at the same time putting in ma uh, management practices that will allow for sustainable use of the Great Barrier Reef. We think we're running about neck and neck. There's a lot of work still yet to be done. There's a lot of understanding to go on and, and to be developed in if we're going to save this Great Barrier Reef for future generations. Quicksilver Connections proves that a joint tourist operator can properly care for the reef. Then we don't have any alternative but to protect the reef here. If there's any damage done to this site, we don't really have an option to move to another area. So uh, we must take a long-term view to protecting the reef and protecting our site and business. And we, we, we try to give a, a hands-on experience to all of the people that come out with us, but at the same time protect the reef. And we prefer to do this through education rather than through restrictions. All of our operations are carried out in the same manner. Uh, we have holding tanks on board that, that make sure that all of our solids and grey water is, uh, is stored on board. And that we, we really take a lot of time out to make sure that, that anything we do out here is, is going to have no negative effects on the reef. Their care is obvious. Otherwise, these delicate staghorns would not survive. Only four of the 300 coral caves are inhabited. Mismanagement in the past has degraded Green Island off Cairns. Rock walls and groins do not allow the caves' sand to naturally move, to breathe. Raw sewerage leaks from an old pipe and discharges at the reef edge. The corals there are degraded, dying, and covered in algae. A new tertiary-treated sewerage plant will alleviate one of the problems. Low Isles of Port Douglas has seen human occupation since the lighthouse was built in 1878. Now the lighthouse is to be demanned and the local Low Isles Preservation Society will co-manage the island with the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority in a unique arrangement to protect its future. Low Isles is one of my favourite destinations, but the corals have suffered over the years from sedimentation and nutrients spilling out of the Daintree River. On Clean Up Australia Day, Low Isles receives a spring clean from the local divers. The future of the coral reefs lies with our younger generation. Marine biologist Andy Dunstan enthuses Port Douglas primary students with the wonders of the reef. So look at this guy. This guy doesn't want to be out of the water. He's trying to find himself a nice little pothole. Hey, little crab. So we'll put him back down in here. And there he goes. He's right now. OK, let's have a look under this rock here. You're Oh, look at him go. Beautiful little moray eel coming across, hiding back down into the shelter. And look at this. Starfish. A little starfish. Okay, no, don't. Just put your hand right down. And feel the arms move. Back with your forwards, just gently. Now let him go off your hand into the water. Alright, what about this guy here? Do you think this fellow is? 
Stuck under there. Oh. Get under there. And so a lot of animals around here. But you've got to be careful when you're walking, just walking in the sand and not treading on any of these animals. And at the end, just return them exactly where they were to start with. Please squash it. Please squash it. No way. <laughs> Beyond the Great Barrier Reef in the Coral Sea, far, far from any polluting source, lie islets and coral reefs which are absolutely pristine. It's a privilege to be here, to gaze in wonder at this amazing coral garden, as yet unsullied by man. Most Pacific Islanders have made little impact on their coral reefs. Their traditional ways of fishing limit the catch to their daily needs. Providing native communities shy away from allowing massive tourist resorts, their coral reefs will remain in a healthy state long after others die throughout the world. John Pennekamp Coral Reef Park off the Florida Keys lures an average of 4,000 snorkelers and divers per day. It's the world's most people-congested coral reef. The Americans are loving their reefs in Florida to death. There are literally thousands of tourists every day going out onto these reefs. And the com combination of excess pollution and over-exploitation, these reefs cannot stand up to this pressure for much longer. Constant boat wash plays havoc with the mangrove creatures. Thoughtless boaters take a shortcut across the shallows, leaving scars crisscrossing the seagrass beds. Okay, you want to make sure that when you're out there that you're keeping your fins high up in the water. The coral is very delicate out there. One of the easiest ways to destroy the coral is with your fins dangling down and with you kicking. Make sure your fins are up above the water. You should be all right with that. In five different languages, we explain about saving the coral. It's a national program to save our reefs so our grandchildren will have a chance to see the coral as we see it today. And this is what they see at Grecian Rocks. It's mostly dead dead, polluted by sewerage waste and loved to death by thousands of tourists every day. The marine park was created back in 1960 with general rejoicing that this American treasure would be preserved for future generations. Hold on to this line that Rick put out for you. Practice with your equipment for a few minutes, get comfortable with everything, then work off to the left hand side of the boat. I've been coming out to these reefs for about 10 years now and uh, as far as the damage to the reefs or degradation of the reef areas, it's very difficult for me to give you a definite uh, description of what's going on out here because I'm out here on a daily basis. And, uh, when you see the same reef areas over and over on a daily basis, you don't notice any dramatic changes overnight.
Chuck and I came here to the Florida Keys over a quarter of a century ago. The filming then was absolutely exquisite. The colors of the coral reef were magnificent. The water was clear. It was a wonderful place to show people what a vibrant, healthy, living coral reef is like, how it is so productive, and yet it is fragile, and people need to be aware of the way we have to be stewards of our environment. Basically, now when we come in off the water from the reefs, the water at the coast is all yellow, and it really makes your heart ache to see it. You can see out on the reefs today the result of pollution and the deterioration of what was once so magnificent. You heard inside, that's all. It does make you want to cry. There is a contradiction here. The younger divers have seen little change. That is because the damage began over 15 years ago. I had to ask the older divers what the reef was originally like. Greece used to be a vast coral gardens from one end to the other. Beautiful, beautiful Elkhorn coral, particularly on the south, southern end of Grecian rocks. I can remember being small 20 years ago and floating down there, going out with my father on the dive boat, and you could float in literally three to seven feet of water and see beautiful, beautiful Elkhorn coral as far as you could look on that south end. Now there today, the Elkhorn coral is still there, but it's skeletons, it's all dead and taken over by algae. If you were to look at Grecian rocks now, I quite honestly, I would call it a graveyard compared to what it was 20 years ago, going from one extreme to the other. Is the Christ of the sea raising his arms in welcome or despair? The reefs which fringe the islands of the Keys face a number of threats. Uh, not all of those are natural threats. There are a number of man-induced threats which these reefs face. The water that has traditionally flowed down through the Everglades are being tainted with pesticides and fertilizers from this agriculture that you see just below Lake Okeechobee. The wastewater effluent from these urban areas uh, is directed right out into the Atlantic. And the theory is that the Gulf Stream will sweep those uh, nutrient-laden waters northward, but uh, it's been proven that there are countercurrents and eddies which can bring those nutrients back to the reefs of the Keys. Florida Keys are also covered in residential development. 25,000 septic tanks seep raw sewage through the porous limestone into the canals and out to sea. The nutrient discharge is enormous. What we are trying to do with the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary uh, program is to implement a, a management strategy which is patterned after the, uh, the zoning plans which are uh, very successful uh, in the uh, Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. Hopefully we can uh, help bring the, the reefs back Probably not to the way they, they used to be, but at least we can give them a fighting chance. Jamaica, the home of Buccaneer Henry Morgan, until an earthquake in 1692 swallowed Port Royal and his den of pirates. Most of the tourists flock to the north coast of Jamaica, to Montego Bay and Ocho Rios, where plush hotels cover the beaches, and a holiday atmosphere prevails. Jamaica is heavily populated and poor. Their dollar is worth only five cents. Unemployment is high, so they turn to the sea for subsistence, and they fish and fish until the seas are empty. The major human impact upon coral reefs in Jamaica has been the effect of overfishing. And what has happened, um, the herbivorous fish have been removed, and this has major effects upon the coral reef community because it means that algal growth flourishes, and this algal growth then has a negative effect upon coral reef growth. 
The trouble with fish pots is they're indiscriminate. They catch all the coral reef fish, essentially. They don't they distinguish between different species. And they use inch mesh here, which is far too small. In addition to this, opposite areas of higher population density, such as towns like Montego Bay and Ocho Rios, there are um, there's quite a lot of effect with it because of the outflow of sewage treatment plants. And um, we also have gullies that run directly into the sea that have untreated sewage running directly um, into the water and then also having a very strongly negative effect upon coral reef growth. I join a group of scientists from the Discovery Bay Marine Laboratory who are working on the reef. They are measuring sections of the reef and counting the percentage of live corals. Only 10% are alive. That's 90% dead. You notice that there weren't a lot of live corals and the reason for that of course is that the damage from Hurricane Allen and then the stress and the corals as a result of uh, the hurricane. You also notice that we didn't see any of the black diadema, the black spiny sea urchin mm -hmm. at this depth. We were at a depth of about 35 feet. And uh, that was because of a virus that occurred about five or six years ago. The diadema are starting back again. They're moving deeper and deeper. And as they move deeper, they they graze on the algae. and. Um, the algae are, com the corals are competing with the algae for sunlight and nutrients and um, now that we see that the diadema are eating the algae, the corals are returning. You also notice that we didn't see very many fish and the reason for that is that the whole north coast of Jamaica is a very, has a very narrow nursery and the fishing practices, you notice the fish pots down there didn't have any fish in them at all. We only saw bottom feeders, we didn't see any fish swimming in the water column. And the reason for that is because the fishing practices are so concentrated in these areas that the, the fish are just entirely gone. But the good news is that it looks like the corals are coming back. That's maybe in our lifetime we won't see it, but in the next generation they will. Bauxite mining is big business and a big polluter. I took sediment samples in the Blue Hole in Discovery Bay and when you look at them at, in the microscope you can see a lot of bauxite in them. There is a constant spill of bauxite into the bay, smothering the corals. Add to this the septic sewerage leaching from the waterfront homes. This workman is drilling into the coral for a gazebo foundation, illegal perhaps, because he kept turning his back to my camera to hide the drill. The parrotfish inside this trap should be outside, in a vital role to eat the algae smothering the corals. The Caribbean has been a mecca for diving tourists, for tourists for, for many, many years. But unfortunately the reefs are degrading quite badly there. For instance, on Barbados, on the west coast, they have built tourist resorts up and down the length of these beautiful beaches. The sewage is flowing straight out under the reefs and they're being degraded. Beautiful Barbados jewel of the Caribbean, home of the green monkey. Too lovely a place to spoil. Yeah, I would say about 20 years ago when I started in water sports along Barbados, you know, along the reef here, was all about 20 feet from the beach. It was a lot of life. You had sea fans, coral, sea urchins, white sea urchins, the black sea urchins, and all that's disappeared now. My personal opinion is that a lot of the water brings down the chemical from off of the hills, which is on the plantation, into the sea, and has killed all the reef along the coast. Yeah, I'm going to the end. Yeah. 
Yeah. I don't like women work. Really? Money too small. Too small, yeah. That's very nothing. So you see, ain't easy out here, right? Ain't easy, you know. This is hard work, man. Like, we are fling the bell, man, you know? You know what I'm Barbados rum is famous, but its refinery on the beach is a disaster. Yeah, this is the Barbados rum refinery. Uh, it still let, lets go a lot of waste into the sea, which is destroying the reefs. I can remember when I was a young boy growing up on this beach, there was a time when you couldn't swim here, you had to wait for two days sometimes because all the the whole beach, all this area was brown, brown. What they've done now, they've put a couple of pipes, which goes out about maybe approximately a mile out, but it still uh, pumps the waste into the sea and destroying the reefs. B below here now you have the light and power, which is pumping hot water into the sea. You see some of the local kids, they're playing it, and you know, the local people come down and have a swim here. But this hot water again helped destroy the, the reef because it's pumping hot water into the sea. A broader problem is the string of hotels along all the beaches leaching sewerage into the sea. The inshore corals I saw are 95% dead. So the tourists are taken to a pocket sized sanctuary where they feed the little fish. We have good evidence now to suggest that the um, nearshore reefs, on, particularly on the west coast of Barbados, um, have been deteriorating probably over the last uh, two decades. Uh, we think that the principal reasons for this are increased eutrophication and sedimentation of the coastal waters along the coast. The principal sources are probably agricultural runoff, increased um, domestic sewage release, and uh, to some extent industrial effluents in certain parts of the coast. The increased nutrients increasing the algal cover on the bottom and the, al the algal cover on the bottom, this, this um, smothers the corals, outcompetes them for space on the reef. Luckily in a Barbados context at least, the effect is quite localised. It's our near shore fringing reefs that are, that are really being affected. Uh, we have a, a, a lovely reef about a kilometre offshore and out there, um, none of our studies have detected any deterioration, nor any um, worsening of the water quality conditions. And the scientists in the country uh, are working closely with the government in the country to try to address the problems. Governments in this country can legislate for coral reef protection, and many have done so. But that legislation is ineffective without public support and without the ability to enforce the legislation. Most of these countries are too poor to enforce the legislation. However, the people that use a coral reef, the subsistence fishermen and the locals, and also the tourist resort operation operators, know that their reefs are important, so they will protect them and look after them. So we're talking about a real collapse in the Caribbean reefs, and only a few around the periphery will be left there in 30 or 40 years' time. My last stop is Belize in Central America, where an ancient civilization cut building blocks from an uplifted coral reef, now lost to the jungle. The Leeds is a small country almost identical to North Queensland, a wilderness of tropical rainforests, endless mangroves, wonderful wildlife, 400 coral caves, and the second largest coral reef in the world. A pristine coral reef, an endless coral garden, the way it once was in all the Caribbean. Many of the coral caves are inhabited and overdeveloped with sewerage and waste problems. 
This island has an indigenous fishing village. They were until recently subsistence fishermen. Then the demand for tourist resorts and exports began to strip the sea of grouper, lobster and conch. The discarded shells are used as landfill. Southwater Cay is on the Outer Barrier Reef, and as you can see, it is overdeveloped. But Leeds is beginning to make the same mistakes we have seen elsewhere in the Caribbean. The Blue Marlin Lodge caters mainly for divers. Denny Nelson is their dive master. Well, there's areas in Belize. Uh to the north of here that are becoming relatively used, but about 90% of what I know about this country, uh, it's very pristine, it's unused. Uh, there's very lush corals. I've been here about four years, and just in that period of time, you know, I've noticed an influx in the number of tourists. Uh, and so far, it's still holding its own. Uh, I've seen very little impact on the corals. Uh, but again, you know, we want to just hope that uh, with the proper attitude, uh, both divers and operators, that uh, it'll survive this influx. Nearby Caribo Cay is a picture postcard island. It is a research base for Washington's prestige Smithsonian Institution. We have had particular problems with coastal degradation in general, in particular uh, trying to fit development in with the ambience of the islands and of the reef itself and making sure that there are adequate mechanisms in place for um, disposing of solid waste and disposing of liquid wastes. I think we are very often not recognizing just how even small amounts of liquid wastes released onto reefs can do immense damage. I can smell the sewerage in the lagoon from the thunder boxes and the septics in the porous limestone. Where the nutrient-laden water empties out onto the encircling reef, I can see some of the corals dying. Fortunately, the algae eaters are swarming over the corals. The Coral Cay Conservation Group practice what they preach. They have installed a compost toilet which does not pollute and are developing management plans for the protection of Belize reefs. The idea is to survey a 180 kilometre squared area uh, with the aim of setting up a marine reserve. Um, this marine reserve to, to be established needs a management plan and for this management plan there needs to be um, a lot of information gathered on the habitats, the species, the threats, uh, all the problems that are going to affect this marine reserve. Uh, at the moment the volunteers are performing uh, fish censoring work. They're going out in uh, the three and they're surveying various groups of fish on the reef, on the various subzones of the reef. Uh, the idea of this is to, um, to produce information for the fishery people so that fishery quotas can be drawn up. We can find the stability of the uh, fish population by looking at the numbers of juveniles, where they're found on the reef. Uh, it's very important information for any management plan, certainly for, for the area. The management plan that we're drawing up at the moment uh, is based along the same format as the Australian Barrier Reef Management Plan uh, and it's hoped that this will be finished in two months and then implemented before the end of the year. Um, when that goes ahead, there's also, we've heard, the chance that the area is going to become a World Heritage Site, which is excellent news for the Keys because uh, this means there can be no further development of any form, uh, which is fantastic for conservation. Belize is now at the crossroads. Will it go the same way as its Caribbean cousins at the whim and pressure of tourist developers? Or will the government, by the wish of the people, create a marine park 
and fully protect this second largest coral reef in the world. The recent development of a 25-year strategic plan for the Great Barrier Reef will ensure that the Great Barrier Reef will be around for a long time. I think we look forward to our children and their children being able to see the reef very much as it is today. We probably need something like the Antarctic Treaty, a multi-nation treaty to protect those reefs and conserve them. They are mankind's resource, they're our treasure. We need to look after them and guard them. Some countries will stem the polluting cause and see their coral reefs regenerate. Others may never have live corals again. The damage is simply too great. The coral reef, in all its wonder and beauty, may be for them only a memory. <laughs>